Voir dire. Should you be selected to serve in this grand jury, your duties shall include the hearings of accusations of criminal activities, receiving preliminary evidence, and making an indictment, or determining that no indictment is indicated. Do you understand? We're in the business of establishing blame. Who is at fault? Please give us a name. We're in the business of establishing blame. Who is at fault? We'll give you a name. Do we understand what's expected of us? Should 
an indictment be handed down, the accused must then stand trial for the alleged offense. Ah. Most certainly. My proper name is Graydon Andrew Greenwood III. Ah. Without hesitation, sir, I can assure you that should I be selected to serve on this grand jury, I shall accept it with the utmost sense of responsibility and a dutiful reverence for the judicial process. Now please be reminded that an indictment in and of itself does not necessarily mean that the accused will be found guilty. I 
do, however, serve on the boards of numerous community organizations. In fact, I'm the chairperson of the State African Violence Society. <laughs> Yes. 
and prosecuting attorney Larry. My name is Alexandra Chaney, and I'll be representing the accused in the state of inquiry versus Mercer versus Violet. During the next several days, it will be your charge to determine if due cause exists and if criminal prosecution will occur. I don't want to underestimate the awesome responsibility and challenge that lies before you. As you listen to the information and decide if the accused should be tried for criminal action, I trust that you will exercise careful consideration and caution. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Larrabee, do you have any further instructions or advisory information to the jury at this time? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. As Ms. Chamberlain has just stated, it is your duty to determine if probable cause, a reasonable cause, exists to indicate that a crime has been committed. You must also determine if an indictment should be handed down against the accused, Trigger Wiley, for such a crime. Now, I believe it bears repeating that you are an accusatory body whose function does not include a determination of guilt. Now, should an indictment be handed down, the accused must then stand trial for the alleged offense. However, will not necessarily be found guilty. You must consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Ladies and gentlemen of the grand jury, the proceedings in the case of the State of Missouri versus Wiley are scheduled to start tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. You are hereby compelled to attend court, and I am also compelled to inform you of the court's most recent decision. As you know, you were selected upon jury process in parts due to your displayed lack of knowledge and matters to be considered at this inquest. This incident has already attracted great public and media <coughs> attention. Because this is one of circumstantial evidence and no motive has been established, therefore, I am sequestering this jury as of this moment. <laughs> order! I hereby order this jury to be isolated from public contact. You are, you are instructed to avoid any form of newspaper, radio, and television exposure unless previously approved by the court. Due to the potential notoriety of this inquest, it is essential that each juror avoid any form of exposure to television, newspaper, and radio. You will be escorted to and from and confined to an area of a hotel whenever court is not in session for the duration of this inquest. This order is intended for, to prevent tampering, unauthorized communication, and trial exposure to publicity. This matter, as it is in all such cases as this, all jurors will remain in the custody of the court, and all instructions must be obeyed implicitly. Will the court administrator please escort the jurors to the destination? Talk show. 
everyone enjoying this as much as I am. This is fascinating. I am so interested in the spellbinding statistics of your daily lives. Or the totally titulating tales of treacherous road conditions during inclement weather. Please, please continue. Unless someone else would like to hop some bath products. Or share some more photos of toothless, runny-nosed little hellions with the group. I sense some anger here. <laughs>
size of animal would you be? <laughs> oh, yeah, be. Doesn't that sound strategic and fun filled? Perhaps afterwards we could all dance the hokey pokey. And the grim
exhibit. instituted by the state, you are chosen and sworn to look into matters of fact and render a decision based on the evidence presented to you. Now, in order to render such an indictment, you must have reasonable grounds for belief in certain alleged facts. Facts that show that the accused has committed the crime with which she is charged. Now, it is my duty to establish those facts. Fact. A three and a half month old infant boy is dead. The victim of a death that occurred as the result of drowning. Fact. That tiny infant's 19 year old unwed mother is accused by the state of Missouri for suspected homicide in that drowning incident. Fact. Now. Throughout the course of the proceedings, Miss Chamberlain, seated across the aisle next to the accused, will try to convince you that this was simply a situational mishap, an unfortunate occurrence, a tragic accident. You will find Miss Chamberlain offering all types of alternatives and ambiguities. You may be asked to consider criminal negligence or accidental homicide. However, despite such potential smoke screens, I insist that you always remember to return to the simple facts of this case. And that's all. Just the facts. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Chamberlain, could you please offer up your opening statement to the jury at this time? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you as well, Ms. Larry, for that unexpected and impressive introduction. However, your accuracy of forecasting my forthcoming strategy is far less impressive. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, some of what Mr. Larry had anticipated is accurate. I believe that the evidence we will be examining will illustrate that Cricket Wiley should not be indicted or tried for any crime. Cricket Wiley is a victim of herself, a victim of an unfortunate occurrence, an occurrence undesigned by the accused. I intend to show that accidental death resulted due to unexpected and unintended means. Mr. Larry's references to smoke screens and ambiguities is where his prediction resolves. I intend to establish each point in this investigation with precision and clarity. Ladies and gentlemen, be advised that this is an investigation to determine if criminal prosecution will occur. It is the burden of the state to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Cricket Wiley should be subjected to accusations by indictment. More than mere suspicion is required. Thank you, everyone. With these arguments having been stated for the record, we may proceed. Mr. Lambie, you may call your first witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The State of Missouri would like to call to the stand Christopher McNinch. Philip, would you please sworn the witness? Now, Chris, 
Do you know why you've been asked to come here today? On account of Cricket Wiley, because what I seen on the bridge that night. So you know Cricket Wiley? I know who she is. I've seen her sometimes. Could you uh, point her out for us today in the courtroom? That's her sitting right on over there. Now, how do you know Cricket Wiley? I know where she lives. I've seen her lots of times. And where does she live? In the shack, just across the old railroad bridge. <clears throat> yes, and have you ever walked past Cricket Wiley's house? Hell no, I ain't going nowhere near that place. Oh, well, why is that? Count on the old woman's crazy and she's a witch. Are you referring to Cricket Wiley's mother, Callie Wiley? Yep, that's what I'm talking about. Now, why would you think that Callie Wiley's crazy? Because I see her, and she's always screaming and digging in her garden. They're putting black magic curses on people. One time I see her speaking to the devil, but she run me off with a switch. Were you frightened? I fear not, especially a bunch of witches. Now, do you ever recall seeing Cricket Wiley's father, Hector Wiley? I ain't seen him, but I hear him sometimes hard at the women. He's an old timer and stuck pretty much to the house. I see. Now, son, would you recall for the jury? What it was that you witnessed on the evening of May 19th on the bridge? I seen Cricket Wiley kill her man. Objection, Your Honor. The witness is making a bold generalization, which is totally unfounded and inappropriate at this time. Sustained. <coughs> now, Chris, uh, what time was it when you were on the bridge? Um, after seven. Around the seven. I know counting when the sun was just going down the river. And uh, what were you doing on the bridge? Nothing. I was just sitting on the catwalk having a smoke and pitching rocks at the river. <laughs> well, then where was the accused, Cricket Wiley? I seen her down in the river bank, waiting the reeds with a satchel in her hands. Ah. Now, uh, what did you witness the accused doing as you, oh, I'm sorry, Christopher. You were sitting on the bridge, right? Mm -hmm. Now, from where you sat on that vantage point, what did you witness the accused doing? I'm sorry, what did you see and hear? I heard Cricket Wiley singing. Oh, singing? Well, what did you hear her sing? Hell ain't no song I ever heard before. Couldn't even make out none of the words. Just a bunch of hocus pocus mumbo jumbo witch words. Black magic <coughs> and I hear the baby crying. Mm -hmm. So now, what did you witness the accused doing as you heard her singing and heard the baby cry? She kept up lifting the satchel up over her head and singing it back down in the water. The water was choppy and the baby kept up crying. Hmm. Now how many times did you see the accused raise and lower the satchel? I don't know. Thirteen, I guess. The cries kept on coming louder and louder. After a time, they stopped. Mm -hmm. So after a time, you heard the baby's cries stop. No further questions, Your Honor. Miss Chamberlain, do you wish to practice some cross examination? <coughs> Most certainly, Your Honor. Christopher Meach, isn't it true that you often sit up on that catwalk of the old railroad bridge on many evenings after supper, smoking cigarettes and throwing rocks into the river? I guess. Isn't it also true that from where you sit on that catwalk, you can see directly into the upstairs window of Cricket Wilder's home? Ain't my trouble, she ain't got no blinds or curtains on her windows. Do you ever watch her undress? I ain't that hard up. Objection! <laughs> Your Honor, Miss Chamberlain, why well, she's trying to discredit the testimony of my witness. Yes, Your Honor, that is true. <laughs> Mr. Larry's sense of clear voice seems to be heightening. Sustained. However, I want to obtain no further sarcasm from the defense. Christopher, you testified a moment ago that Cricket's mother, Callie Wiley, had an quote, run you off with a switch. What was that? Count out she's crazy and she buries stuff all around her yard. Now, isn't it actually because after several occasions of you throwing rocks at her home and writing cuss words with tar on her front porch, she discovered you stealing vegetables from her garden? She was crazy and coming at you with a stick. She was angry and threatened you with a stick, driving you away from her property. Christopher, do you ever tell lies? Sometimes. Do you ever exaggerate, stretch out the truth a little? <laughs> I reckon. How do we know that what you've said for us today isn't another lie or an exaggeration? Count on the truth. 
So you said, from where you sat on the catwalk, smoking cigarettes and throwing rocks in the river, you say you saw Cricket Wiley down on the riverbank, surrounded by reeds. The sun was going down. What was Cricket wearing? I don't know. A dress, I guess. Second, she had a hood up covering her head. She had a dress and a shawl and a hood up covering her head. So you couldn't see her face, could you? I know there was her eye here to see. May 19th had been a hot day. It was a warm evening. The fog was rising up from the water, wasn't it? Yeah. The sun was setting. The figure you say you saw had her face covered, obstructed from your room. Your view, surrounded by reeds, didn't you? I know it was her cricket wild, preach with two, trying to be. So you said. No further questions, Your Honor. Stop. 
right, guys. We'll be done. Let's have some fun. <laughs> Mr. Chambers, you have elevated our audacity to our radic and symphonic levels. Oh, oh, how much more is that? I can pay. <laughs> I agree, Christy. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be at home with my family. I'm not like the rest of you. I care too deeply. I can't sit in room day after day listening to stories of neglect and misfortune. Well, honey, what do you expect? A candy cream? It's because of how much you do care that you belong in here. This isn't easy for any of us. None of us knows how long we're going to be in here. For one person, maybe play poker or tell a pretty joke. I'm in. For another, like Mrs. Sneed, and maybe locking ourselves in our hotel room and going to sleep at sunset. But we each must do this stress in our own way. Does uh, anyone want to know the logic of stress? No! <laughs> Now this reminds me, she was supposed to take back that movie. <laughs> Yourself as 
Cricket Wilder's friend? Well, no. Certainly not friends. Cricket really never had any friends that I know of. I was so kind of sorry for her. On account of the way she was picked on and all. That's just the way I am. Ask anyone. I would try to be a toward her and all. But she was what you call peculiar. She was awful quiet and left to keep pretty much to herself. What do you recall? Let me rephrase that. Do you recall when you first met Cricket Wild and Miss Sparks? You can call Manola. Would you please repeat the question? Certainly, Nola. Do you recall when you first met Cricket Wild? Well, I can't say exactly, but I was in school with Cricket since she was just a little girl. I reckon we was about six or so, since we both went down the country or the same school bus to school. You testified a moment ago that you often felt sorry for Cricket Wiley. Would you mind elaborating on the reasons? Well, that's just how I am, you see. I just felt bad on account of how she was always getting picked out of school and on the bus by the other kids. <laughs> Would you describe <coughs> being picked on? Please be specific. Well, all right. Lots of kids made fun of her. Oh, I think. On account of the way she looked. Hair all stringy and dumb over her face. You know how kids can be. They were always fun in her better clothes, being the too big and too small on her. She looked like she might have got a sex sometimes. I see. Did you and know those times she would come to school barefoot? Even when she'd wear shoes, they'd be all scuffed and muddy and run down. Sometimes the boys in the bus were peanut butter hair and call the names like crazy, cranky, crazy, cranky. I think we all understand. <laughs> How did Cricket Wiley strike you as a student? Well, who knew? I'm sure I didn't. She was out sick in Miss Other Days. And when she was at school, she was so quiet and all. It was odd how she never talked much and always kept her head down. Sometimes she would fall asleep right at school desk and somebody had to poke her and wake her back up. I don't think she'd keep up in class very well. Oh, I think. Because she was always out so much. Nola, you certainly have a fine memory. Oh. <laughs> when would you say it would be the last time you saw Cricket Wild? Well, I reckon it's been eight years or more. We started out the seventh grade together, but partly it's that year she just up and quit coming to school. For a time, the school bus stopped alongside a house every morning, but she was never waiting. One morning, her mom was at work in the yard, and, and she took her shovel and went the bus right on past. The boys in the bus were cutting up the yellow windows and they see her. After a time, the bus just quit stopping her altogether. So, Nola, to your knowledge, Cricket Wiley has not attended school since the seventh grade. Is that correct? Well, best as I know, there were lots of rumors <coughs> circulating the school yard about her over the years. But I can't be bothered paying them no never mind. Of course not. No further. Just kids talking, I suppose. You know how that goes. Some saying she was run out of town for being a witch. Some saying she was dead from getting hit by lightning. Then, about a year or so ago, one of the girls, Anna May, said she saw her walking down a gravel road at that rat creek in her bare feet with a baby in her belly. Thank you, that's all. Of course, nobody believed her. Because Anna May is always telling tales, and we figured who'd want to get cricket while it, well, in the family way, anyhow. Some of the bus actually thought nothing of it until that story broke about that baby being drowned and all. Poor little thing. No further questions, Your Honor. Please step down from the stand, Mr. Oh, of course, but is that all? Are we done? <laughs> <laughs> Just her 
her and me and the boss of the big, you know what I mean? <laughs> All right, now I could tell by the way she was checking me out, she wanted me bad, man. All right, she'd been giving me the old ones over since the second she walked in. Now I'm telling y'all, she was hot. <laughs> All right, all right, so just head her next, bro. All right, get her out here. All right. I walked up to her, looked her right in those big baby blues and said, hey, Angel Eyes, nice dress. I think it would look better on my bedroom floor.
jury calls its next witness, I would like to introduce into evidence the sworn statement of Dr. Lester Stillman. Dr. Stillman, due to an unfortunate call to duty today, is unable to be here. However, he has instated me with the sworn deposition. And I would like the bailiff to read the underscored paragraphs 12 through 14 to the jury at this time. So, mental retardation defined as a condition of significantly sub-average intellectual function manifested during a person's developmental period, existing concurrently with a demonstrated deficit in adaptive behavior. As a psychiatric evaluator, I have such cricket wise intelligence quotient which registered at 58. IQ between 50 and 63 indicates mild to moderate retardation with the accused having mental age of a six and a half year old child and social maturity of a nine year old. Thank you. With this evidence having been stated for the record, we may proceed. Mr. Larrabee, you may call your next witness. The state of Missouri calls for the stand Mrs. Callie Esther Wiley. Yes, but Mrs. Wiley, on average, 
What length of time would you estimate Cricket to have spent in the woodshed? Never too long, never more than a day or two at a spell. Oh, only one or two days at a time. Eighteen hours, twenty-four hours. Mrs. Wiley, have you ever stopped to consider your daughter's feelings? Have you ever considered what must have been running through her head during those times? Have you ever considered how frightened and scared she must have been boarded up in a tiny, dirty little woodshed with only insects and spiders for her companions in the days at a time? You must understand, Mrs. Larry. The girl doesn't have emotions like you or I, Counselor. She carries the same. Wow. What do you think? I
Now, you're right. Isn't life wonderful? Wonderful? What's so wonderful about it? The way things work out. Child, what are you talking about? I haven't seen such antics since old man Miller kissed Widow Brown out behind the first bar. Miss <coughs> I mean now, I've spent my entire life studying history. I've studied all the great romances, Antony and Cleopatra and Nicholas and Alexandra and the Duke and Justice of Windsor. But I'm, I'm so sick and tired of studying history and teaching history and never have created any history for myself. I'll always tell my students that those who do not, do not learn from their past are forced to repeat it. But lately I've come to realize that nothing happens by accident. There's a reason for my being here. There's a reason for all of us being here. I think I finally met my destiny. Thanks a lot. What are you trying to say to me, girl? Now, don't you see? For the first time in my life, I think I finally fall in love. I should have seen it coming. I would have thought you and that Mr. Monroe would go together like ham and egg. You got all that fancy book learning just like you. I'm not talking about George Monroe. I'm talking about sure. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't even know what to do. I'll guide you through. 
can't rightly say how it made her mama feel. I reckon Callie must have known about it for a time before it was I caught on. If she did, she ain't never let on. It's not Callie's way to trouble me about such things. She'd rather talk to God than talk to me. I see. Well then, Mr. Wilder, would you kindly of recount for us what was your reaction when you caught on, as you said? I figured by then. Wasn't a damn thing I could do about it. <clears throat> Mr. Wiley, <clears throat> as a concerned parent, did you give any consideration as to who might have fathered Cricket's baby boy? Never could be too sure. Her mama tried to get the girl to say, but all she ever got was a bunch of crazy babbling. Never could make any sense of her. I figure the girl don't even know for sure. <laughs> you know how that is. No, Mr. Wilder, I'm afraid I don't. Suppose you tell me. Ain't no secret around these parts. Young girl comes to town and boils all around the countryside to pick up on that scent. Boys come sniff around like a bunch of town cats. What the hell am I supposed to do? Stand out on the front porch with a bucket of water all night? No, I imagine that would be a reckless indifference on your part now, wouldn't it? Well, I won't say I ain't speculating on it. For a time, I thought it could have been Haynes Lynn. He's a town boy that comes around our parts looking for work every so often. Then I figured it could have been Andy Greenby from over four inches road. He spent most of the last fall pulling up wild mustard in the field down the road. Then I turned to the woman to look at that baby. I took to think it was crooked knife. He's a little engine. It was only about a dumb on the rock for him. Well, Mr. Wilder, it would appear that you've given this matter considerable thought. What was it that led you to deduce this fine theory? Maybe come out all red skin and squishy. A tiny little thing, one much bigger than nothing at all. Callie said the child was the color of the saint himself. That was quite a somber statement, Mr. Wiley. It would appear that you and your wife were quite practiced at demonizing this young girl. Your daughter, who sits here in this courtroom, with a sword of Damocles hanging by a thread above her head. It's difficult for me to understand. The ignorance, the superstition. Perhaps that Miss Chamberlain would care to wait to the end of the proceedings to make her closing argument. Perhaps Mr. Levy would care to kiss me. I will have order in this courtroom. <laughs> the jury's asked to disregard the defense's last statement. Mr. Wiley, you may step down. These proceedings will recess at, until 10 a.m. on Monday. At which time I expect both counsels to reemerge as mild as models of propriety for the proceedings of this case. I remind you that you were not to speak to anyone about this case. I thank you for your compliance. Counsels will approach the bench. Betrayal, Michael. That's a good one. Or better yet, unfaithfulness. Say, 
Why not usury? You can write volumes on that one. <coughs> uh, you know, your problem really is Alexandria. Oh, you really have it, I know we have you. Law school was a long time ago. You really should try to let go. You never did know how to let go. That's why it's still stuck in the public defender's office. I don't know how you sleep at night, Michael. You know, and I know, that the only reason you passed the bar exam was because I supported you every step of the way. The difference between me and you, Michael, is that I think character counts. Oh, dispense with the bar routine, will you? Look, I know why you're so hypersensitive about the case. It's because you can relate to the accused. You know, it's really not all that complicated. I mean, you and Cricket are both two frightened, lost little souls who never got enough of your dad's attention. I'm going to pretend I didn't hear you say that. Well, that would be keeping with the rest of your rich fantasy life now, wouldn't it? You just go right on pretending. You know and I know that Cricket Wiley doesn't stand a chance in hell. This is an open and shut case. You just go right on pretending. That always was what you did best. You never did know how to let go. And you never did know how to feel.
All the ladies at the church are so impressed by this that after the sermon, they go over to the, the minister's house to tell him how good of a job he uh, did. So um, when the ladies get to the door, the wife comes up to the door and says, um, she says that, don't believe a word he says, he's only done it twice, and he fell off both times. <laughs> oh. Please, give it up for the comedy silence of Mr. Hoffman. And now, before our evening draws to a close, we present our grand finale. I would like to present to you right now Miss Barbara Taylor Boone, who will charm us with her reading from The Prophet by Cahil Gibran. And then Alatra said, Speak to us of love. And he raised his head and he looked upon the people, and there fell a stillness upon them. And with a great voice he said, Love beckoned you to follow him. Those ways are hot and steep. And when his wings unfold you, yield to him. And though the, though the sword hidden among his pinions may wound you, and when he speaks, you believe in him. Though his voice may shatter your dreams as the north winds lays waste the garden, but even as love crowns you, so shall he crucify you. <laughs> even as he is for your growth, so is he for your pruning. Even as he ascends to your height and crushes your tenderest branches that cling on the sun, so shall he descend to your roots and shake them in their clinging to the earth. All these things shall love do unto you, that you may know the secrets of your heart, and in that knowledge you will find that life's heart. And think not that you can direct the course of love. <laughs> For love, it will find you worthy, directs your course. Love has but no other desires but to fulfill itself. But if you love and must needs have desires, let these be your desires, to melt, be like a running brook that sings its melody to the night. To know the pain of too much tenderness. To be wounded by your own understanding of love. To believe willingly and joyfully. To wake at the dawn with a winged heart and give thanks for another day of loving. To wake at the noon hour and meditate love's ecstasy. <laughs> to return home and eat the time with gratitude. And then sleep and prepare for your beloved in your heart. And a song of praise upon your lips. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cooley, for reminding us to keep our minds and our hearts open. And now, I believe it is time for us to take our places for the Grand Forces. I thought you'd be well.
celebrate Thanksgiving by gathering our loved ones around us and eating turkey with all the turkey.
No further questions. Let the record show that the witness has shown her affirmation.